signs of trouble. What are we going to be talking about today? We're going to get into trouble? Uh, I don't know. Maybe a little bit. Um, you know, I was thinking about the doctor and physical checkups, probably because I've been reading way too much about all of the uh, all of the waves of sickness that are kind of hitting the country right now. I guess I've been reading medical articles, so um, so my my phone is feeding them to me in my news feed. You know, <laughs> um, I think most people though they they go to the doctor for an annual health checkup. You know, they go to the doctor, and and what do you think the doctor? What do they usually ask you? What's the first thing? They're like, is there at least this is with me is they always ask you, is there anything, any changes that you've noticed or anything that you're concerned about or is there anything that you have noticed that is different than it was before? Any new symptoms that has caused you some level of concern, right? That's what usually they, they ask you because little changes in your life can, can be, mean big things down the road. Um, I was reading a, uh, a story about this guy that was on <laughs> that was on TikTok, and you know, uh, this is this is a little a little bit gross. Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a warning. But this guy was doing a video about how his wife liked to remove blackheads and pimples from his back, right? And so she was, they, he was filming it because people want to watch this stuff. I was not watching that. Okay, I was reading a story about a medical thing. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, so the the way the the story went is basically that as his wife was doing this, somebody that was watching this noticed that he had a strange mole on his back, and and sent him an email or something and said, hey, you know, maybe you should get that checked out. That's a weird looking mole on your back, and and so he did, and it turned out to be skin cancer. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, he was glad that he went to the doctor and had it checked out and surgically removed, and he had a big scar from having a big section of his uh, skin removed. You know, it's a pretty painful process. You know, he was probably thinking, you know, I should definitely listen to this advice, because most people are taught that if there's something wrong, some kind of change that they notice physically, then maybe they should go to an expert to have them check it out if there is any reason for concern. I know with myself, um, I, I was having a hard time staying awake. I was tired all the time. Uh, probably, oh, I don't know, it's been over 10 years now since I've been diagnosed with sleep apnea, but I went to the doctor, I told them about it, they sent me to a sleep study, they're like, huh, you don't breathe when you're sleeping, <laughs> so you need this this machine to blow wind in your face, and uh, that's that's what I did. And you know what? It really helped me out. I, I feel a lot better physically now than I did uh, before that. Uh, it 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 changes um, it ch it changes your life when you address the things that are physically wrong with you when you're paying attention uh, to your body, right? Uh, last story, I read this story in Forbes about this woman that went to the doctor for annual checkup and she noticed that they had abnormal uh, testing. She went for several more tests and, and eventually she found out that she had cervical cancer and had she not gone and had that screening done and gone to her annual checkups and, and fastidiously went every year to make sure that she was in tip-top health, um, then it would have gotten missed and her very early form of cancer would have been spread all over her body and her lymph nodes, everything else. They said it would have been much, much worse and it was great that she was screened out early because she was vigilant and diligent about paying attention to her physical health. And I think a lot of us are cognizant of that, right? We, we do pay attention to our physical health. Um, but how often do we think about our spiritual health? How cognizant are we about that? How much um, time do we spend thinking about what has changed with that? Do we have some type of melanoma on our spiritual skin, right? You know, there's, a, there's an interesting passage in the book of Hebrews that tells us and reminds us really to do that very thing. Um, 
And, and, and there's a warning at the end of it, but it really is telling us for the good of our health, right? Just like your doctor tells you you need to go to your annual exams, you need to do all these things that are important for your physical life. So the Bible tells us the things that we need to do that are important for our spiritual life. And I'm going to take you to that passage here. It's from Hebrews 10, uh, 23 through 26. He says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving a knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. There's a lot going on there, but this is basically telling us what we need to do for our spiritual health. That's what it is. It's, it's, it's telling us what's going to happen and why it's important. I think of this passage as a check for our spiritual well-being. And, and it tells us to do a number of things. And I want to go through those things. I'm going to refer back to this passage as I explain those things. Uh, but the first thing is, he tells us to be vigilant, to be on guard, to watch for warning signs in our spiritual health, right? Um, he says to hold fast to the confession of our hope. And to hold fast means to tightly grip onto something, to seize it and hold on to it, to pay attention to it. You could say paying constant attention to it. If you are pulling somebody up off of a cliff, you have to grip their hands tightly and make sure that you pay attention to what you're doing because what happens if somebody distracts you from your task of pulling your friend up off the face of a cliff? Well, you could get distracted and see a squirrel and you let go, right? And that person would fall. So when he's saying to hold on to your hope, to hold on to the confession of your face, he's saying hold fast to that like you're pulling it up off the face of the cliff that you need to be constantly um, thinking about that, that that has to be something that's a priority in your brain, that you need to do a self-check, right? And, and Paul, Paul basically tells us to do that same very thing when he says to examine yourself. He says this in a couple of different places. He says one time in uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Make sure you're, you're holding on. To your faith. Make sure you're holding on, your grip is secure, right? Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourself that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? And then he also makes a comment similar to this when he's talking about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, these are a couple of places where Paul tells us to really assess our faith, thinking about where we came from. In the first example, he's saying, I taught you the gospel, and what you know is from me, so look back about, at yourself and, and examine yourself and see that what I'm telling you is genuine and true. But the fact of the matter remains, he's saying, do a self-assessment. Really think about what you believe in, what you think, and why you think it. And, and, and he's saying the same thing, basically, in regards to the Lord's Supper. He's saying, do a self-examination. You know, make sure that your grip is tight, that you're focusing on the right things. And we think about that as we take the Lord's Supper, and as we have that prayer, we think about the importance of what Christ did for us. We're reflecting back on that. We're finding back the center of our faith. We're going back to the source. We're really trying to get to the heart of what's truly important about what we believe in, right? So those things are important to do. And, and the Hebrew writer is saying the same basic thing when he says hold fast or to grip onto it. Don't let that go. Hold on to the core of what makes you a Christian. Don't, don't let that go. Keep holding on to it. So 
And he says how we do that, right? If we go back to our Hebrew passage, our original passage that we started out with this morning, he gives us a couple of ways to do that, right? And the first of those is let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So that is, that is the first that's the first step that he gives us, right? Um, he says to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And this is the first step in maintaining a spiritual being. Loving God and loving one's neighbor as oneself are core principles, right? Core principles to what it means to be a Christian. And, and if we look at what Jesus tells us is, is core and fundamental to our faith in God and, and what it means to be a follower of him, the most important, greatest commandment in the law. We, we see Mark 12, 29 through 31. It says, Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord, with your, with, <clears throat> love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That gets to the real heart and core of what's truly important about Christianity, right? So when, when the Hebrew writer is telling us to go back to love and good deeds, to, to focus on those things, to make those things priorities in your life, he's really reflecting on the same kind of things that Jesus is telling us are the most important things to God, to love people, to treat one another as you would want to be treated, right? To love your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. Because love is a good deed in and of itself, right? Love is an action. In the Bible, love isn't Twitter patient or feelings of whatever, but it's an action. It's how we treat other people, that we put other people's needs and concerns before our own, that we, that we extend ourselves for the benefit of the other person and with no expectation of reward only that you can see that that person is uplifted and enriched by what we do. Love your neighbor as yourself. So how would you want other people to treat you? With what kind of respect and love would you like to be treated? Well, that is how we should extend it to other people, right? To others. There's another statement, too. Uh, it says in Matthew 25, 40, this is what Jesus says. He says, the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. Right? So, again, we're talking about love and good deeds. And where that love goes is to your neighbor. Right? To your fellow Christians that are here in this church. That, that, that's a grounding principle. And, and if we look at what the Hebrew writer is saying in our original text, he's saying this is where you begin. This is where you start. This is what you need to do. You need to remember these fundamentals, this most important thing. Um, and that's the type of attitude that we should have and that we should maintain in order to have spiritual wellness in our faith. It's, those are like eating all the healthy foods that keep you alive, right? Your doctor tells you, don't eat quarter pounders, you know, don't pound them. Not even dirty keto people that peel the buns off the outside and just eat the, the meat inside. That's still not good for you, right? Because of all those fat and all those calories and it's just really bad for you. Well, he tells you to eat vegetables and, and drink lots of water and to, you know, eat lean white meat and all these other kinds of things, right? You're, we're supposed to stick to a, 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 a diet that is healthy for our bodies. Well, this is what's healthy for our souls. This is what the guy who wrote Hebrews, and we don't know exactly who wrote Hebrews. That's why I keep saying the Hebrew writer, because if you look, some people say it was Paul, some people say it was Apollos. We don't, we don't know. What we do know is that it's inspired and that it is good stuff. So with that in mind, what he's saying in order to have a healthy spiritual life, he says, focus on love and good deeds. Love and good deeds, and love itself is a good deed. So, uh, so that's an important thing. That is the vegetables, okay? And then, and then he gets to another point in that passage where he says this. He says, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Right? So whether we can be here in person, which is a blessing that is still permitted, 
or whether we're here together online, however it is that we can find ourselves to come together, it is vitally important that we maintain our assembly of our, of our members here. That um, it refreshes our spirit and our soul. It brings us back to things that are true and right and good. Things that are spiritually righteous. That are right with the world. When we spend the entire week at war with dark and evil things that are always trying to interrupt us. You know, because what does the Bible tell us about Satan? It says he's like a, a prowling or a roaring lion, right? And that he's always seeking to devour and destroy us. Do you think that Satan just takes a break? <laughs> he doesn't take a break, right? He's always on the move. He's always trying to get you to question or leave your faith. He is trying to be tricky about it, too. He's like that little melanoma on your back. And if that guy wasn't doing that TikTok video, who knows what would have happened to him, right? But that's Satan. He's a little melanoma on, on, your spiritual, on your spiritual skin. And he wants to become cancerous. And he wants you to walk away from your faith. He wants to kill your faith. He wants to kill your spirituality. And, and you know, when we come to the assembly, when we come together in worship... It's like that guy on the TikTok video where he shows everybody his melanoma, right? Well, it, it's, it is and it isn't, right? In, in a sense, it is. Because we're here to encourage each other, to be here for each other, to bear one another's burdens, to lift each other up, to give each other strength to get through the week. You know, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I... I did not like going to church a lot of times. Can you imagine that? Because I got up early. I hated that. Uh, on Sunday morning, uh, I was like, always want to do something else. Um, I was, I don't know. I remember we drove about an hour and 20 minutes to church one way. Okay. It was, it was about 80 or 90 miles. And we would go from where uh, my parents live now all the way down to Plastow, New Hampshire, which is a long, a long way, okay? And I would, like, oh, man, I don't want to do this. I hate this. I would get up at, like, you know, 6 in the morning, and we would leave for church at, like, 8 in the morning and say, this is terrible, right? But then when I got there, when I got to church and I was with other people that I shared a faith with, other people that, that believed the same way that I did, then I felt refreshed. I felt better. I felt great that I had gone, that I decided to, that my parents said, you're going to church, whether you like it or not. And I'm thankful to this day that I did. Because even a week away, or a couple of weeks, or a month, you drift so far away, you get so out of contact with the things that you really need to keep you grounded, to keep you centered. Church needs to be the focus and the centrality of our lives. That's the way that God designed it. Jesus wanted us to remember him. Do this in remembrance of me, right? He wants this to be a focus of our life. And that's why this guy from Hebrews, he says, don't forsake the assembly. Don't forsake our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, this is, this is a positive thing because we're all in this together. We're all in a struggle together. We're all trying to make it through this life and get through to the other side and be with Jesus Christ for an eternity. That is the goal. And church, our coming together helps us to achieve that goal. It is like your annual exam, but you do it every week because face it, we're bombarded by evil constantly. There is bad stuff out there constantly trying to get us to do the wrong things, to not care about the things that we should care about. Get us off track, you know? So that, that's why it's such an emphasis, right? That's why it's such a thing. Um, so we've got one more little passage here. And this is, this is the, the warning passage, right? He, he says, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving a knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, 
but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversary. So why, why does he follow up this encouraging, come together, don't forsake the assembly, do good deeds, and love each other, and he follows it up with this, and it, it just seems like a big heavy right at the end. It's like this truck, this boom, you know, and you're like, wow, that's harsh, <laughs> right? Um, but the same thing happens when you go to see your doctor, right? And I, I've had this conversation with my doctor in the past. I don't know if you know this, but I was 50 pounds heavier than I am today, and I am still pretty heavy, you know, to be honest. And when I was at the height of that, my doctor was like, so, um, you think about trying a diet or something, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you, might, you might want to try something, you know, there's all these, maybe you could see a nutritionist, you know, something that would help you, because not only that, and then if I, if I wasn't being good with my, my CPAP device also, they, I would bring my card in, they say, you know, that if you don't use your CPAP machine, that causes hypertension and heart disease after years of not doing it, and you should really be in the habit of doing that. You should be, in, you should be taking care of yourself, right? You could die early. And that's a hard conversation that you have to have with somebody that you have with your doctor. But that's the conversation that this guy in Hebrews is having with us on a spiritual level when we think about things that are eternal. He says, you know, you've been eating lots of quarter pounders lately. You really need to quit. You need to stop doing that, <laughs> right? That's what he's doing. He's like just, he's your doctor. You know, is it any coincidence that Jesus is called the great physician, right? Because he tells us what we need to live. And, and, and he's getting to us and what we need to live eternally our eternal life. So that, that's, that's why, you know, this is your doctor being real with you. You know what I mean? Um, anyway, there, there's that passage. I didn't put it up there. Sorry about that. But anyway, it is a true but difficult conversation that we have to have with our spiritual doctor, right? So, In conclusion, and everybody's like, oh, they, you know, now people don't need to close their Bibles because it's up there, right? But they're doing it in their brain. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, in conclusion, to maintain good spiritual health, we should be pursuing a righteous and good lifestyle, right? We should be pursuing good deeds, and we should be loving neighbor as ourselves, loving God with all our heart, our mind, and our soul. And we need to be here for each other, right? We need to be the assembly. We need to come together, whether it's in person or if it's on the internet. And, and I'm so thankful for that. And I should tell you that we, we get about anywhere between 45 and 60 independent viewings of this live stream every single Sunday. So there's a lot of people here with us right now that are watching and that are being encouraged by us maintaining our services and being together. And, and they're all part of our assembly. Even if we don't see them, think of them as here in the cloud, right? You have all this information in the cloud with your Apple devices, your Apple cloud. Well, we have a spiritual cloud, right? But it's, main, it's important to maintain that connection with the assembly. Um, and then... We have to be on guard for what happens if we just keep pounding cheeseburgers, you know? That we can't go on living in sin. We have to check ourselves. We have to get back to where we need to be, into fighting weight, you know? <laughs> that all those things are important to remember, to maintain our spiritual wellness. And that's what the, the guy from Hebrews is trying to get across to all these folks. And as we're reading it now, that's what he's trying to get across to us. So it's important things to think about. At this time, I want to offer an invitation for any of those who have not yet responded to the gospel. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you want to change your heart, turn your heart towards Him, and you want to repent, um, change your mind, have a godlike mind, focus on the mind of Christ, and if you're willing to be baptized in commitment to Him, 
And what God has promised us is forgiveness of our sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and eternal life with Him. That's something that's on your heart that you want to do this morning, and I want to encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing our closing song.